thanks for tuning in today. Today I want to share some thoughts with you on the King James Version Bible. Sometimes I get some comments on my uh, YouTube channel from people who hold a King James only position. And I want to distinguish between two types of people who hold a what might be called a King James only position. One type is very militant, very um, confident, very, well, frankly, sometimes rude. Um, and there's another variety that is more careful, more thought through, uh, more charitable. These are people who have a very good uh, Christian disposition. And it's to that second group uh, that I'm making some comments today. Uh, the first group, you have no interest really in what I say. If I say anything that's different than your position, then you're ready to attack, and, and that's fine. Uh, this video won't help you in any way at all. You've already made up your mind, and, and that's okay. Uh, but this video really won't help you. Uh, I'm not sure what I could say that would change your mind. And I had one from the second group that um, I'm not sure I, I, he would call himself a King James Version onlyist, but he made some good comments on one of my videos and had some things that he had thought through. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not real confident. I think he's thought through his position enough that I don't think I'm going to change his mind. But I think this topic is worth talking about, and so I know I'm going to upset some people, um, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you at least what I believe to be the truth. And so maybe the best way to just kind of jump into this is to um, kind of go through uh, the comment that was left. And I had this person's permission to uh, share his comment, uh, to maybe be sort of a springboard for some further thought and discussion. Uh, so he said, he'd asked me, uh, do I think that the Bible is my final authority? And I said, yes. Uh, he said, do you think it's your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? My answer was, of course. Uh, and he says, that's great, so do I. Now please, one more question, which Bible is our final authority? And this was my reply. I said, I think it's any Bible which accurately conveys the original Hebrew and Greek text. If you're asking if I think that the KJV is a final authority, and sorry if you're not, I would say insofar as it accurately represents the original text. Now this is where it gets interesting. Um, he says, okay, but doesn't that present a few problems? One problem uh, is there are not... Uh, Sorry. One problem is, are there not many, many Greek texts which in some places do not agree with each other? So let's address that. Uh, he says, so when we're trying to ascertain the original, aren't there a number of Greek texts that disagree with each other? That's true to a certain extent, uh, but they mostly agree. Um, so if you take um, on the two ends of the spectrum, the Textus Receptus, which would underlie your King James Version Bible, versus an eclectic text, a text like the critical edition, the Nestle Allen 28th edition, those are going to have somewhere around 94% exact wording agreement. So we'd say there's like a 6% difference between those texts. But that doesn't mean that there's a 6% difference in meaning. Uh, so a lot of that difference has to do with word order, spelling. Some of these things you can't even bring into English. These are things that this um, commenter would... Uh, no, and by the way, again, I, I have high esteem. If you're watching this, uh, you know who you are, and um, I mean, no, uh, everything I say here, I want to say with the highest respect uh, to you and to you that hold positions like his. I mean, no, no disrespect. I have no quarrel with you. I just want to explain where I'm coming from. So these are these have you know this maybe six percent difference, but not six percent difference in meaning. And I would say that the message, the gospel message, whether you use a critical text or the Textus Receptus from the Reformation era or the Byzantine text, all of those have the same basic gospel message. 
I think that the the truth of the gospel, the the basics, the the things that Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, the things that Paul taught in regards to salvation and justification by faith, all those things, all those essential truths are all there. As a matter of fact, there's some people who would use a, uh, well, I'm thinking of two scholars right now. One is Dr. Jeff Riddle, and the other one is James White. Those two men have had a debate. One holds to one Greek text, the other one holds to the other Greek text, and yet they're both Reformed Baptists, and I think they both adhere to the same confession of faith. Um, so I'm not going to say that there aren't instances where those differences will impact how you might exegete individual passages, and I'm not saying that that is unimportant, but the general outlines and the basic form of the gospel, in fact, all of the major doctrines are to be found in, in both of these documents, and most of these differences are small. Uh, now, I do think there's some that are significant, and those are worth investigating, studying, uh, learning about uh, all of that. So not to diminish it, some people underplay it, like these differences don't matter at all. Some of them do. Uh, but as um, someone that I'm familiar with, and I've uh, mentioned on this channel, who I've even had on this channel, Dr. Darrell Burling, there's going to be more difference between a, conser a, uh, a formal translation, say like the NASB, in the NIV, which is basically based on the same Greek text, in their wording, then there is going to be in the difference between, say, a Byzantine uh, Greek text versus a critical edition. In other words, translation philosophy is going to affect it more than Greek text uh, themselves. So there you go. Uh, so as, as far as, yes, there are differences in, in Greek text, but we don't want to overplay that. He says, another problem concerns the common layman who only reads English, loves the Lord, and wishes to read and study the Lord's Word as instructed. And I appreciate this. And I would say that, again, I think any English translation, good, reputable English translation, especially the, the formal translations, you're going to get the basic form of the gospel, all the basic teachings. I think you can teach every major doctrine out of any major uh, translation, I think some translations handle some verses better than other translations, uh, but I think any good English translation will do the job uh, for the basic understanding of the gospel and what we're to do. I think where we really struggle is not some of these picky little differences. I think, at least in my own life, I can talk about my own life and my own struggle against sin. It's applying the verses that I do understand. It's applying the verses that I that uh, Jesus taught us, if I could live the Sermon on the Mount, if I could live Matthew 5, 6, and 7, if I could live that way, um, then, you know, I would be doing really well. It's not these little differences that Christians have, have trouble in applying the Scriptures. It's, it's, the, it's the practical application sometimes, and trying to uh, manifest the sort of character that Christ has called us to. Uh, so that's one response here. Okay, then he asks, does this man need to learn the Greek just to read a perfect New Testament? Um, I don't think that every person needs to learn Greek. I think it's a good thing if God puts that in your heart and you desire it, and I think some people do. But I don't think everybody needs to learn uh, Greek. If not, then this man must depend on a scholarly go-between to tell him what the Word says. Now, if you don't learn biblical languages, there what he says here is act really correct, I think. There is a scholarly go-between. Now, that scholarly go-between might not be living, but there's still a scholarly go-between. The, the men who translated the King James Version Bible were scholars, great scholars, brilliant scholars. That's why the King James Version is a wonderful, marvelous translation. It's my favorite translation. I was working trying to get through the ESV uh, this year, and I had to get back to the King James Version because I just love it. It's beautiful, and it's it's marvelously accurate because indeed it was done by it was done by great scholars, brilliant scholars that knew Greek and Hebrew very very well. Uh, so if you're using any translation, there is always going to be some sort of scholarly go between, and that's because. Um, these languages um, are uh, 
not living languages anymore. There's some arguments about uh, Koine Greek. I don't want to get into all that. But uh, for the most part, these are not um, languages. People aren't greeting each other and, and speaking back and forth on the streets in, in Koine Greek. Modern Greek is much closer than some people think, though. But that's another thing. There's always going to be a scholarly go-between if you don't learn the original languages. Okay, however, this man knows the veil was torn, and he is indeed the temple of God, but to find the perfect word of God, this layman must submit to another man's authority. And I appreciate what this person's saying. I really, really do. Um, so here, here's the issue here. Um, think of the literacy rates historically throughout church history from the earliest days on. Even when people were speaking Greek, and they knew Greek, and, and they spoke, conversed with uh, Greek, they weren't carrying around leather-bound Bibles like we do today. I heard an estimate on one manuscript that was put together, and it, it would cost, um, I think, to produce this one codex, ancient codex, and, you know, uh, it's 3rd, 4th century, I don't remember what era exactly, but in that period, it would have cost like the equivalent of $16,000. People couldn't run down to Dollar General and buy a cheap Bible and hold it in their hands in those days. And even if they could, a large swath of those people would not be able to read it. So we are privileged today to be able to hold these these Bibles in our hand. But what I want to say is that the church has always been, in some measure, reliant on teachers. That's why God has given the church teachers. And so the the fact that um, there are people who teach the Word of God, read the Word of God aloud, this has always been a feature of the church. And so the fact that you can have a leather-bound, uh, gilt edge uh, Bible with cross references. This is a modern uh, convenience. It's a modern blessing. It's a good thing to have, uh, but historically that has not been the case. Uh, and he says, "Does one actually feel this is a system intended by the Lord?" It's very confusing. And this, I, I really do appreciate. I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the comment here, and, it, and the person who's writing this is not writing this as a got you or anything like that. He's really trying to provoke uh, thought. And I think one of the things that one of the concerns, and part of my target audience here today is um, is people who don't hold this position, but to understand why some people kind of hold this position, is that they want to hold in their hand a completely perfect book. Um, not something that's floating in the ether, but something that's completely perfect. And I think, uh, for my part, I think that God has given us um, good access to the Scriptures. I think we have um, wonderful, marvelous translations, but I think any time that... Um, it, well, let me say this. If you read the preface to the King James Version Bible, it gives you a good idea what the translators of the King James Version Bible thought themselves. Uh, they were not claiming for themselves that God was re-inspiring the Scriptures, or that they were apostolic men. Uh, I think that we did get the Scriptures um, from God, as the holy men of old uh, wrote as they were moved by the, by the Holy Spirit, but there is no guarantee that any time another man comes and translates that, that he's going to do it completely perfectly. And there was no promise that I see in Scripture that he was going to re-inspire or perfectly guide the translators of the King James Version Bible. And that's not to say that I, I, I think the King James Version is a, is a bad translation. I think it's a marvelous translation. I encourage you, read it, learn it. If there's some words uh, that you don't know or you don't understand, it's worth learning some of those words, especially if your first language is English. The King James Version is a marvelous translation to use and, and absorb because so much of our language is based on it. It's glorious, it's beautiful, and I just, I, I gush uh, with my enthusiasm for the, the King James Version Bible. Uh, but I don't hasten to disparage um, other attempts, other translations. That's not my goal. I think there's some that are better than others. Uh, but having the... Um, the willingness to approach this subject as honestly as we can and deal with the reality 
uh, that's really on the ground, and to look at the larger historical situation. That is to say that when you hold up in your hand, and I'll grab my Bible out of my desk here. This is the one that greets me in the mornings. Early in the morning, I'll have a Greek New Testament that I read from, but I also open up uh, this Bible. It's a friend and a companion. But the the beauty of being able to hold this book up that has the 66 books, which I consider to be canonical, uh, this, again, is a sort of a modern phenomenon. I, and I ask you this question, when was it historically that the average Christian could pick up a Bible that had precisely the 66 books which he thought to be, uh, which we now think to be the authoritative canonical word? I would say that that's a relatively recent phenomenon. And if you look historically, and you look at the translations that have been done, translations that were used over time, you don't have anything that matches exactly this 16, uh, the original King James uh, Version was in 1611. There's nothing historically that exists before it that matches it exactly. And so if, you, if you're demanding that sort of perfection, if you're thinking that this is the perfection and you're demanding that for the average layman to always have access to, uh, then where was it prior to 1611? And indeed, where is it in other languages? Uh, I can tell you my wife is a Spanish speaker. She grew up uh, in, in Mexico, and her, she has a Reina Valera, which is very close to the King James Version, but those two editions don't agree exactly either. So let's go on and look at how the conversation progressed a little bit. Uh, he said, let me give you an example of what I said above, and then... He goes into, uh, we were talking about translations. Therefore, as a layman, I turn to the scriptures for God's meaning of to translate or perhaps examples of the action. In the KJV, there are three examples of something being uh, translated. What he's talking about is the, using the word translated. Uh, one is the kingdom from Saul to David, while the other two deal with people, the Christian from death to life, and Enoch from this world to heaven. I would note that each of the three translations... The, using the word translation, that is, is an improvement. It is for the better. However, when we look at the same scriptures in the NIV, the NASV, the ESV, or the MIV, no mention of translation, the word translation, that is, is made. What's the layman to do? How does one decide which is accurate? Um, and this is when I think that doing original language research is... Um, important. I think it's good to be able to have teachers that you can talk to uh, that can look at some of these things. Um, but I would say that the layman, if, if and I'm not saying you're claiming this, uh, if you're watching this video, I'm not saying you're making this claim, but I just want to clarify this. Just having a King James Version Bible as a layman is not going to answer all your questions. You're going to need some sort of tools. Uh, there's words that have changed meaning over time. Um, that the typical um, English speaker is not going to readily recognize, that you're going to misunderstand. I know this because I've done it sometimes. I've misunderstood some verses uh, because words have, have changed over time. And so there's there are good tools to use to help you kind of understand that, and I think it's, it's a good idea to utilize some of those tools. I have a, a dictionary from the 1800s by uh, Noah Webster. Uh, there's other tools that are out there to help kind of define how some of those words have been used, but you're still going to be reliant in some way upon some sort of tool. But again, I do think that God has given the church teachers. So if you have questions like this, Ask someone who studied the original languages. Do some original language research as well. Um, now he's going to go in. I'm going to skip just a little bit here, and uh, feel free if you're watching this video uh, to correct anything if you think I misrepresented you in any way. But he said, let me explain my position. I do feel God has preserved his word in English. At one time, his messenger spoke Hebrew, then Greek. However, now his messenger... Uh, to his word, speak English. I've shown where a translation which has the hand of God involved is always better than the original. 
God gave the originals, but where are they? If he wanted us to use the, uh, use the original, original, it would be available. I do feel we have the perfectly preserved Word of God as he wants it, and from viewing various versions, I've eliminate, eliminated all but the KJV. And again, I appreciate the, um, the love that this man has for the, the scriptures. Uh, I will say this, though. So if you're trying to adjudicate uh, which Bible has been preserved, uh, to me, there's an issue here, and I don't want to make too much of this, but um, how are you going to adjudicate whether you're going to use a Cambridge, like I've got here, or an Oxford edition of the King James Version Bible? Because they're not identical. If you have an Oxford edition, there's a place in Jeremiah, uh, and there's a in Jeremiah. If you have an Oxford edition, or whether you have a Cambridge edition, it's going to differ as to whether there is a uh, the word he versus the word ye. Um, now that might sound like a minor difference, and it is. One is a second person plural, and the other one is a third person singular. But how are you going to adjudicate which reading is right? Which King James version is right in that? regard? Well, I think the answer can be that we go back to the original text. And so I think you're still left with a dilemma, because again, it's not just that one letter difference between, there's a few differences between these various editions of the King James Version, so you have to adjudicate which King James Version you're going to use, and I would suggest that even in doing that, you're going to have to appeal to some sort of outside um, references of some sort. Uh, so I don't think it's the the thing that you can take your King James Version and get along with God and get all the answers. Um, how do you know which King James Version is the exact preserved um, Word of God? And so I would try not to claim anything beyond for the King James Version that the King James Version translators themselves were willing to do. And indeed, the King James Version translators themselves put translation notes where they thought there might be some uh, places where the translation was ambiguous, or maybe uh, an alternate translation would be possible. All of these things. In fact, in the original King James Version um, translation, there are some notes where there's uh, where they note manuscript differences. Uh, I think if you read the, read the preface to the King James Version, I don't think they expected or were intending to produce the final authority for the rest of Christianity for all time. I just don't think that was their intent. I don't think they thought that they were doing that. Now, again, I hasten to add, I love the King James Version. I wish you would love the King James Version if you're watching this, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have to take it as uh, as re-inspired or anything like that. But again, I'm, I would, I'm slow um, to say that something's mistranslated as well. I've noticed numerous times where I've gone to the King James Version and looked at a modern translation. And sometimes I think the King James Version nailed it in, in a way that maybe a modern translation might have missed. Uh, but I'm always willing to try to look back um, at the text and see. And so uh, I'm trying to get at this person's question as best I can. But I, I do just want to recognize that there is a historical reality uh, to what we're dealing with. There is this development, there is this movement, um, and if you look historically at what Christians have uh, have had access to throughout the church age, I don't think that's going to lead to the fact that the King James Version uh, is going to be your final authority. Now, it might be for you, King James Version might be your authority, and that's fine with me. I have no quarrel with you, I have no problem with you, and I don't go out of my way to point out where I think the King James Version is wrong. I very rarely use the word mistranslate, um, just because sometimes I think there's more than one accurate way uh, to translate a text. I might suggest a more literal translation, or I might suggest a translation that's different, but I'm very reluctant um, to just say, that, oh, this is an outright mistranslation, because there's been some times where people have really hastily said that about not just the King James Version, but other translations. I've heard people who know nothing of Greek or Hebrew throw out the term mistranslation. This is mistranslated. Well, no, it wasn't mistranslated. It's just that you don't understand what's happening in the original language, or you don't understand how the language has changed from 1611 to, to today. So I think um, there, are there are issues in the translations, 
to look at. Uh, and I don't think that we solve the problem by just appealing and picking one translation and saying this is our final authority. Now, again, that being said, um, I've met wonderful people who de do have a King James only position who I think have genuinely be, been saved by the Lord, rescued, and that they are good, faithful, charitable Christians. And maybe your only experience with people who hold a King James only position has been miserable, horrible, they've rude and obnoxious. I want to tell you that that's not how everybody is that holds this position. It's because they do hold to the, a high view of Scripture, they believe in inerrancy, and they want to find where that inerrancy is. And so for them, they've settled that that inerrancy lies in one English translation. I don't think that works historically. That's not my view. But I think for those who are willing to engage in the discussion respectfully and um, cordially as brothers— uh, I think we should not be so quick to just dismiss people who have sincere and honest open hearts that want to seek. I'm telling you, there are people who hold a, a high view of the King James Version that are out there. So my only plea is, um, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, because ye have love one to another. I would much rather be able to show the love that Christ has, has given to us for my brothers and sisters, and be able to get along with them cordially and show them what it means to be a Christian, that's probably more important than working out every single detail, every single... Um, uh, <laughs> we can, we can um, strain at gnats and swallow camels if we're not careful to borrow some language from the King James Version. I exhort us, I encourage us to let's love one another and uh, get along charitably with one another and seek for understanding as we grow towards more knowledge of the Lord.